This video is presented to you by Physics for Students. In this video, we are going to look forward on the topics of topology. So the topics concerned are what is a topology, uh, what is a topological invariance, uh, what is called homeomorphism, what is Euclidean space, what is a topological space, what are open sets, what are open intervals, and a mathematical proof of topology and topological space. Well, I would just like to tell the viewers is that these are the basic building blocks of what consists of the huge topic which is called topology. This is the first video, so we would be looking forward with the basics of topology and I will try to make it as simple as possible so that with a basic understanding of set theory and mathematics, people are able to understand the definition and what is called topology. I would also like to tell you that this is a very basic idea and a very basic video on topology. The further videos would be dealing with more mathematical entry cases. So to start with, we need to know what is topology. So topology is actually uh, is what we call is the study of shapes which can be stretched, which can be squished, and otherwise deformed, keeping near points together. So as you see right in front of your screen, that these are different shapes. Uh, the first one is a cup, the second one is a torus, and on the extreme right hand side, you can see a small animation where the uh, cup is being morphed into a torus and the torus is morphed into a cup. Now this is for those who know topology who has been studying this is a very common kind of a homeomorphism which is viewed uh, in a very common manner. So what we are trying to tell is that it is a study of shapes and it is uh, it can be stretched it can be squished but keeping near points together. Now nearby or near points is a very undefined term which roughly means a small neighborhood in a metric space. In a metric space, if two points are located, uh, they are called small, and here we call it neighborhood, right? So in this picture, uh, you can see a set V in the plane is a neighborhood of a point P if a small disk around P is contained in V. Now this, uh, mm, I would say the small disk which is around the V, uh, which is the plane, this has got a lot of implications which we can take it later, which is called a small ball, open ball, lot of uh, things are there. So let us first understood that nearby is an undefined term right it is called a small neighborhood in a metric space two points are located they are called small and here we call it a neighborhood so in this picture you can see uh, what i tried to show you now suppose x is a topological space and p is a point in x a neighborhood of p is a subset v of x which includes an open set containing in p now all these terms what I'm saying right now my, might sound a little bit odd but these things will come clear in the video. So what I told you mathematically is this, right? So don't worry about those terms, it will become clear as we proceed. And now you can also think of this one as you can move uh, one point around a surface and it should not leave that set right these things i i will be showing in a small animation so this is just a basic definition to start with with a topology and you can think that if you can there's a small perturbation and you move a point around a set it should not leave the set well uh, in this particular figure you see uh, the property is preserved under homeomorphism now what i'm trying to show you is that once this cup this direction from the left to right when this cups is being uh, homeomorph is undertaken a homeomorphism and has become a torus so i have shown shown on the left hand side this green arrow on the top which shows that the cup is being deformed into a torus and now you see this 
uh, cup can again be regained into a torus that is why the arrow is shown from the right hand side to the left hand side so what i am trying to tell you is that even if you mathematically consider this to be a function which is a cup and it is being uh, undergoing homeomorphism and is a become a torus the reverse of the function is also true that means the torus can again regain into a cup so here you see the property is preserved under homeomorphism right now you can just think homeomorphism as a corresponding between two figures such that the function and its reverse are continuous now I have shown if you have seen my first video where I have used certain clay materials in order to give you a basic understanding of topology tearing and gluing is not allowed right but the thing is that that is entirely not true there is something which is called a dent twist which we will come forward is a topological move or a topological i would say yes a move that cannot be achieved without cutting and pasting so i i would like to tell um, i have given the uh, first video of mine in the description box where you can see what i have told that this can be changed without gluing or uh, without tearing but that is not true there is something which is called dent twist which uh, makes things like that and we are going to see forward in this video uh, now if in this uh, particular uh, uh, form if you see uh, a very rudimentary sketches uh, where these triangles we have learnt in school days this is uh, what we call congruency this is side 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 then we have got this angle side and uh, another angle then we have got uh, this RHS all these are basically what we are trying to tell they are congruent to each other right so what I am trying to tell you is that when we speak of Euclidean geometry there is a concept of what is called congruence right so once we tell the concept of congruence two shapes are congruent when one can be mapped with the other right so I can take it in this way uh, why I am explaining Euclidean geometry right now instead of topology things will become clear but congruency is something which we call that two shapes are congruent when one can be mapped into another which you can see that the simple sketches of triangles right hand side and isosceles shows how they are congruent to each other if I take uh, this part of the, uh, uh, um, the video where I'm trying to show you this then two shapes as you see the first left hand side right angle triangle has been rotated in this direction and has taken this shape right and also this angle I have just uh, uh, taken abrupt 110 degrees can be taken into this right so now you see here angles do not change when you slide and rotate however no deformations or twists are allowed so the first figure is rotated the second figure is rotated yes and you see angles are congruent and there are no changes of rotation so this is a typical kind of a property which we see when we are undergoing Euclidean geometry that is under rotation or when we are flipping around the angles are congruent the concept of congruency now what I'm trying to tell you here is that if you see in the left hand side all these can be termed in a group called polygonal shapes right triangle quadrilateral octagon nonagon decagon hexagon pentagon heptagon everything can be grouped in as polygonal shapes so the first idea which we are learning in topology is that these polygonal shapes can be changed to any other shapes right so uh, it can be squeezed it can be stretched it can be morphed into any other things and this is the first difference that we need to know that from polygonal shapes we are now shifting our idea and knowledge and everything into any kind of a shape and this is particular to topology so now you see here polygons are being replaced by any shapes right so this is the first when we are venturing in the arena of topology polygons of typical Euclidean geometry are replaced by any shapes and congruency is replaced by topological invariance now by topological invariance uh, I'm trying to mean is a property of topology uh, which is invariant that means it doesn't change under under homeomorphism so now if I take this 
right if you sleep closely when this uh, cup is now being uh, undergoing homeomorphism is turned into a torus the property of the near points are being preserved right so congruency is replaced by topological invariant that means um, i think you can understand in, in in euclidean shape when we say this shape is congruent to this it is it is some kind of a similarity that we are doing drawing but in topology we say that it is topologically invariant that means it is similar to congruency but not congruency but topologically invariance and it undergoes homeomorphism but the properties are preserved and the polygons are now being used and now being taken care of with any shapes now i can call uh, by with a simple example this torus is congruent or i would say topologically invariant to this cup so this is the uh, way in which we are going forward with uh, how topolo from euclidean space we are migrating to topology now uh, technically it it would be this if a space x possesses a property every space homeomorphic to x has that property what do i mean by this let me just take you a quick uh, simple example so if we have got something like this okay uh, a rubber sheet we call topology a rubber sheet geometry so if you get a rubber sheet or a clay in which a circle is equal to a square which is equal to a rectangle so we can squish it we, we can stretch it and we can do whatever we want and we can turn the circle into a square and then further the circle can be turned into a rectangle so the property if you see on the left hand side of your screen i've just drawn an abrupt figure so the property on the left hand side below the object which is in green will be equal to the property which is something like this which has been crushed or which has been uh, undergoing homeomorphism and which will be also equal to this right so this is uh, what we call but yes it should not be torn or it should not be glued but this is entirely not to for the basic of topology just to start with let us assume this as an axiom uh, it should not be torn or it should not be glued further topological advancement tells that it can be done so i think this part is clear once we are done with the first part of the video how the space uh, possesses a property undergoing homeomorphism it is preserving and how the circle is turning into a square and then further into a rectangle now i can also call this as a torus and it turns into this right you see the topological invariance is maintained which is formally defined as this bidirectional mapping of one shape to another which preserves the notion of points being near to each other by bidirectional i have shown the arrow on both sides so it should be on both so this torus which is on the left hand side of the screen marked as blue is topologically the same as this one which is a little bit a uh, different so this is uh, what i'm trying to show you that they are topologically they are the same so now if we have a, a rubber band or a clay if we can form a circle a ellipse a square a torus anything these very different are very different in terms of geometrically but topologically they are the same so these shapes we told that polygons can be this 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 and those who do topology now can recognize right on the right hand side this is what we called a klein bottle so in case that you have a rubber or a clay about what i have shown in my first video you can you can do this kind of morphing in which you can start with a triangle and you can come down to a hectagon or a nonagon and these things are topologically they are the same although geometrically they might be different but topologically they are the same
So if I take a more, little bit more technical, this was a kind of a more of a visual and a intuitive approach. But if I take it more technically, I can call this. The notion of closeness is now uh, is defined by continuity, convergence, compactedness and connectedness. Now this point number two, I can expand a more what is called convergence and why the uh, concept of calculus continuity is more taken up in topology. But anyway, this is not the right video to tell you on that. We can call the notion of invariance that is uh, what we told that uh, the uh, Euclidean concept of congruence is replaced by invariance under continuous deformation. Also it formalizes the notions of nearness and continuity and it generalizes the concept of analysis and calculus which will be uh, we can take it up later in some other video. So the topologically, uh, we can tell the technical definition as this. If X be a non-empty set, a set of T subsets, X is said to be two on topology. If one, X an empty set phi belongs to T. Two, the union of any infinite or infinite number of sets T belongs to T. And the intersection of any two sets T belongs to T. Now in certain textbooks, you might find that T has been replaced by tau. The Greek number, the Greek letter tau, but for simplicity, I have just kept it t. So this is the three, uh, I would say, points. Until they are satisfied, we cannot say the subsets of a x to be on topology on x, right? So three thing emerges from this. Uh, the pair, yes, the pair x comma t is called the topological space. One is union. The second one is intersection, and third one is water open sets. Now before I go ahead with this great figure, what I would try to tell you is that if you have been observing my video, then you might have noticed that what we are doing is that we are trying to generalize things. I mean to say by generalization, if you if you know that Newtonian uh, mechanics has been generalized more into general theory of relativity, geometry is being um, more generalized now into topology, the 2D surfaces now are being generalized more into 3D, the surfaces are generalized into man manifold called Riemannian manifold and everything. So what I'm trying to tell you is that with the advancement of science and mathematics and the different branches of mathematics, group theory, ring theory, knot theory, topology, whatever we are learning, we are going more towards unification or I would say it is more towards generalization. That means we are trying to generalize things easier so that in one particular theory we can explain everything. Okay, so uh, you might have uh, recognized this uh, very famous figure. It is that of Euclid. So topological space is a generalization of Euclidean space, right? Now, once we say that topological space is a generalization of Euclidean space, we mean that we are generalizing the Euclidean uh, space into better forms. Now, if you see that topological space are far-reaching generalization of metric presses, which in turn is a generalization of Euclidean spaces, and which we, uh, we, we which is this. So, Euclidean spaces gets more into metric spaces and metric spaces gets more generalized into topological spaces. At this point of time you might question that what is the use? What do we do? The answer is simple. Simplicity. We want to define everything in a very simple way so that all those axioms etc. can be generalized and can be understood in one particular theory and in one, one particular way. Now when I talk of metric spaces, spaces, what I mean is by this. We have three points x, y and z. The conventional way of measuring it, these uh, points is by a non-negative function. We draw a line and we get this function d of x, comma y. And uh, we can further write at as this. Here s is a set and d is a metric of on s. So this function is no more and it is now being generalized the way we will look forward. So from Euclid, we are moving to metric. Metric, we are moving to topology. By metric, 
I mean to say the, uh, the typical conventional way of measuring points. Now, what is an Euclidean space? First of all, in order to move from Euclid to topology or Euclidean space to topological space, we need to understand what is a Euclidean space. In order to explain the Euclidean space, first we need to understand that what is called a tuple. Okay, so here is the definition. An n-tuple, okay, or a simply a tuple is another word of list. Or you can say it is an ordered set of n element. You can call it as a vector of n or of or n vector, whatever. So say, for example, we, these, we call these n tuples, which are called points. This is a very kind of a basic definition of Euclidean space. So these monad pairs, triples, quadruple, and quintuple, these are some of the examples of uh, Euclidean space. Uh, examples of tuples, I'm so sorry. And now see, in, in Euclidean n space, also called Cartesian space, is the space of all n tuples of real numbers, say x1 to x2, which leads to this r2, which can be called as Euclidean plane. And this can be called as a set of real numbers. So Euclidean space is one, it is a fundamental space of classical geometry. We all know that. It is a finite dimensional inner product space of over real number. We know that. Now, line in a Euclidean subspace is of dimension 1. Two subspaces, S and T, in a Euclidean space are parallel if they have the same direction. This is another point. The distance between two points in Euclidean space is given by this uh, two non-zero vectors v and u of e which is a vector space are perpendicular yeah so if the inner product is zero so this is just a kind of a very quick recap on the important points of what is in Euclidean space now there are other properties like angles isometries Euclidean group well, it would be too lengthy in this particular video. Now, the Euclidean space makes, uh, no, sorry, the Euclidean distance makes a Euclidean space. And thus, it is called a topological space. So, you see that this topology is called uh, this, Euclidean geometry. So, you see that in Euclidean geometry, we also have a topology. So this, this point should be quite clear. So the Euclidean make, distance make a Euclidean space and thus a topological space. So we have topology, which is a generic term in Euclidean geometry also. Well, uh, those who are painting and connoisseur of art might have recognized by this time that what it is. Yes, you are absolutely right. This is the school of Athens uh, uh, painted by the famous Italian painter Raphael around 5, 1509 to 1511. Now, you might be wondering why I have taken this one because here you will see everyone, right? Aristotle you can find, I think, the right in the middle with long beard. You can see Pythagoras, you can see Archimedes, you can see Plato, everything. Now, the basic idea of showing the school of Athens is that they developed axioms. And now we are going to concentrate on Euclidean axioms and how we can take it forward in order to understand what is called a topological axiom. This is a classical painting. I really liked it for the simple reason is that all these people, uh, if you can go into details, you will see they really develop certain axioms. So we are moving from Euclidean axioms to topological axioms. It would be easier for us to understand. Now see, topology is the abstract version of geometry. All geometrical shapes are topological spaces. We take some basic features of the geometrical spaces and try to figure out what will be the consequences of these features. And what are the consequences? Axioms. Then only we can get a very clear picture of geometrical results and their dependence on axioms. Now, mathematical proof, as you understand, is a very watertight argument, which begins with information, proceeds by logical argument, and ends with a proof. 
So to define topological space, we need axioms. Otherwise, how can we prove that? Say, for example, we start with axioms in Euclidean geometry. Uh, we have learnt it in our school days. And then we move into what is called this. So on the top, uh, which is in orange, is a Euclidean geometry. And this is the topological, topological axiom. So you can read the uh, bottom part. I think I don't, it is quite self-explanatory, but we need to go all through that. So now the thing is that we have all uh, been doing this, but there is something important which is called an open set. Now, in order to do this, we also need to understand that why topology is being defined in terms of open set. Yes, this is the pertinent question. Why topology is defined in terms of open sets? Now, one thing is that obviously, as I told you, that we are moving towards generalization. We are generalizing every notion from Euclid to uh, topological spaces. The another thing which comes is that this. Right. So these two points, X and Y, which are quite near to each other. Right. And... We can define it by a function dxy, which we are not doing, right? So we are, you see the purple arrow, this dxy, the function, is being replaced by open sets. So why topology is defined in terms of open sets? Answer is simple. The concept of the function is now being replaced by open sets. The set of all open sets on a space x is called the topology on x. So this is the reason that topology is defined in terms of open sets. So matrix distance equation we are not using and this is what we call is a more generalized form of those you have read you must know what is an open interval. So this is the definition or I would say the rather the crux of the topology that why it is defined in terms of open set because we are not using matrix distance and equation. We are generalizing it in open set which can be thought of a generalization of an open interval. Now, we will come to this part. Once we understood the blocks of the building blocks of the topology, we go back to the axioms and we look into this. So we have to look into the mathematical proof of the axioms. Once the axioms are satisfied, we get the proof. Now, the basic thing that we need to also understand is this. So, uh, as you see in topology, the entire generalization, which is an open interval for real numbers, is an open set. So, uh, in most of the texts that you go through, you will see that topology is defined in terms of open set. You can think of an open set as a set that does not have a boundary, right? Right. So, here is uh, a circle, right? And we get two points, X and Y. We know that now we know that uh, an open set is one which does not have any boundary. I think if we can go back to this part, you see that this is basically the definition of open set. I would like to tell you that we can think of near each other if there are a lot of open points that contain both points. The other way is also true that if there are two points that are never contained in the same open set, then obviously they are very far apart. So in topology, we do not use matrix distance, etc. Now, if I take this uh, particular figure, which is a circle, uh, we know that there are no open sets, so we get this X and Y. So here is uh, something which have two points, and now you see this. Okay, so X and Y that lies within the disk, but not outside, whereas the open set, the, the red dots, X and Y, which is within the uh, circle, and whereas this one is outside, which is within the boundary, is call, called a closed set. We are not concerned about closed, closed set. We are more concerned about open sets. So we have a circle and we have two points, X and Y, that lies within the disk but not outside is an open set and forms an open set. But this one which lies on the boundary are not open sets and it is called a closed set. In order to explain things further, you can think of this. So the green area around the red circle is an open set which has satisfies this equation and this part is the closed set. Right? So this is the open and the closed set concept. So which is uh, got no boundary in one way we can think of it as an open set. 
Now here is a small example which I was telling you that you can think it of a small perturbation or movement but it should lie within the set. So here is something which I have magnified it and then here you cause a little bit of perturbation of the red ball. It goes here, 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 here and here. But you see everywhere wherever it is going it is not leaving the set x right so this is also something which is concerned and you can think of it uh, something uh, you can it will be easy for you to visualize so what is an open set uh, more precisely a set which does not have any boundary which we have seen moving one point in another such that it is also included in the set which i have just shown in the animation satisfy this open set is a generalization obviously of a matrix and instead of using this function we use open sets an open set of r is a subset of e of r such that you can read this forward and here this epsilon is a number that contain in e and for example the open interval 2 comma uh, 5 is an open set any open interval is an open set so both r and the empty sets that is a real number are open we can expand on that but this is not the right time so just it is a, a few important points of defining what is an open set Now also the reverse should be true, that is the complement of the opposite of subset of E of R is a set of all points which is written either by R black slash E or you can write it as E tilde and in that case 2, 5 is not an open set but it complements minus infinity 2 and it is a union of 5 to infinity is open. So this is a quick note on what is an open interval. I won't uh, spend much time. It doesn't include endpoints, right? It is denoted as A comma B. So uh, you just see that we all know that, uh, you know, uh, these braces 0 comma 2, these uh, brackets are called uh, uh, intervals, open intervals, and square brackets are called closed intervals. So the intervals containing all the numbers between 0 to 2, but not 0 or 20. So it can be written as this, or it can be, assigned also as this. So a circle includes the end values and a circle which is filled up does not include the end values. This is very preliminary. I just thought to give you a quick idea of what is an open interval. Right. So as you might have noticed uh, uh, that in topology we are they're talking all about has a point in intersection. So topology in which the intersection of any family of open set is open is called an Alexandrov topology. Well, uh, we will just look into it what I'm trying to mean. Now, this Soviet mathematician Pavel Sergeyevich Alexandrov he contributed immensely on the topics that we are reading, right? And we call them as Alexandrov topology. So you can just have a quick look on his contributions. He was a Soviet mathematician, born in Russia, set theory and topology made quite a big contribution and is known for Alexandrov compactification and Alexandrov topology. Now, uh, Alexandrov actually made his first major mathematical success in 1915 in set theory. He worked with Felix Hasdrov and developed what we called today is a point set topology or a general topology. So in 1920, he developed combinatorial topology. He was the president of the Moscow Mathematical Society, vice president of the International Congress of Mathematicians and full member of Soviet Academy of Sciences from 1953. The basic understanding of this gentleman is that whatever we are learning, the general topology or the Alexandrov topology is because of this. So I just thought to give you a very quick idea of who this person and what is his contribution in terms of topology is. Now, we, we got these three axioms, right? So now what we are going to do right now is that we are going to take two approaches, right? One is a very intuitive approach, which might not sound very correct mathematically to you. I will again repeat these words. It might not sound mathematically correct to you, but it is important to have a visual, visualization of how we are going to prove these three axioms. 
So first we are going to take this x and the empty set phi belongs to t and then we will go for the second and third. So the first approach would be a intuitive and a non-mathematical approach and then we will look into what we call is a more of a mathematical and we'll give examples on that. So here is a figure right so this diagram sh uh, shows set with l x uh, sorry sh uh, it shows set x with elements a b c topological space is a set example x plus a collection of subset x that satisfies three axioms which we have seen earlier this uh, of subsets is this collection of subsets is called a set x so here is a diagram and i can say that the oval you can see these oval shapes they represent open sets so I can call this phi this one this and this as open and if I uh, now the set on the extreme right hand side which we will see is actually the set X itself because it contains the elements a B and C now if we write typically in our conventional curly bracket then we can get this right so you see that uh, you can check it out uh, going back that axiom 1 is satisfied as x equals to within curly bracket x a b and c and t is in the list so x and the empty set phi belongs to 2 is satisfied right so again as i told you it's a very intuitive approach coming to the so what we got we got the first one green ticked that means we are done with the first we are going to find out the union of any finite or infinite number of sets t belongs to t now what we are going to do is that we are just going to take a quick brief look on those who really know they can ignore this part what is in union and what is a intersection I think uh, things are quite clear so we don't need to waste uh, I would say um, we need to take more time on understanding union and intersection now in the first uh, axiom is done so what is the second it is all possible union of the four open sets so if I take the list phi a b and c so I can just take an example a is in union of a b is it an open set definitely it is an open set right we can further take x as a union of a set which is equal to x is already open for example x union a b equals to x we can further take another example phi is a union of a set which equals to that set for example this one so from this what we get is that the union of any finite we have taken for these these numbers actually just as an example is belongs to t and which belongs to t the sets t belongs to t so finally we are done with the first two and then we are left with this the intersection of any two sets t belongs to t so we will go with the same approach all possible intersections we take the list and then we say whether it is an un uh, intersection yes it is an intersection we take for example x intersection a set equals to that set is already open for example this and phi is a intersection of a set equals to phi which is already open so this equals to phi that means we have also proved the intersection of any set two sets t belongs to t so what we have really done is that we have proved the first the second and the third part so now we can tell that all three axioms are satisfied the collection of open sets form a topology on x so you see we are defining precisely what is a topology this means that sets a b and c together with four open set forms an alexander of topology space i'm uh, I, I i try to make things a little bit more specific so i mention um, uh, alexander of's name so you can call it as a topology space so the pair x t is called a topological space So we will now take a few quick examples before we end this video. So we take something like this x equals to a, b, c, d, e, f. These are the elements and t1 equals to this. Then t1 actually is a topology on x. Why? As it satisfied 1, 2 and 3. All right. So you can now understand why I was telling that we need to first understand uh, intuitive understanding and then go for the exact numerical one. So this one is a topology because it satisfies the 
bottom three points or the axioms. The second example would be something like this and then it is not a topology. Why? Because the union of CD, union of ACE, two members of T2 doesn't belong to T2 and hence it does not satisfy these three axioms. So once we have seen which is satisfying this union, this is not satisfying. We take another example, these elements and we try to form a kind of an intersection. It is not. Why? Because two members of T3 does not belong to 3, 3. Obviously you can see the intersection at C and F. So it doesn't satisfy these three axioms. We'll take a further example, which is a more generic one. T4 actually equals to the numbers n and finite sets. Then uh, nb uh, set of natural numbers. Then T4 again is not a topology as the infinite union which goes dot dot dot. Members of T4 does not belong to T4. And hence T4 does not satisfy these three axioms. So this is how you actually try to prove the axioms in order to define what is a topology and what is a topological space. We are have come to the final part of the video which is called a dent twist. As I told you, dent twist is a typical way in which you can uh, take a kind of a donut and you can cut it, okay, twist around 360 degrees, paste it. And this is called a dent twist and the original form or the original points are never restored. So you can do a dent twist. I just wanted to tell you that gluing and cutting is not allowed in topological space is a wrong notion. It is very much allowed if you're using the dent twist. So it is a kind of a self homeomorphism and um, homeomorphism the, 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 the last part that the, this paragraph in blue is actually a technical definition of dent twist. I'm not going too much into dent twist because it is a totally different kind of a subject. Now I would like to show what actually dent twist is through an animation which is obviously not mine. I've taken this from a French first gentleman's channel and I have shown the courtesy. So here is a donut, right? And you get uh, rotated, right? Now you see the red lines which are coming. So what it is happening, it is splitting out or it is cutting out into two parts. Here it goes. Now uh, we twist it and you see how the blue lines are changing. And after that, what we do is that we do a rejoining of the points together and then we rotate it. And then we twist it. Right. So this is a typical uh, kind of an animation which I have taken from Henry Paul and this actually shows what is a dent twist. So that's it. So the first part of the video we have learned what is a topology, what is a topological invariance that is a property which doesn't change, uh, what is homeomorphism, how from Euclidean space we have moved into topological space. Uh, what are open sets, what are open intervals, and a little bit about Pavel Sergeyevich Alexandrov, on whose name we know Alexandrov topology, and what are the examples and proof of topology and topological space. And we learned a little bit and showed the animation of a dent twist. So that's it. So my next video would be speaking on homomorphism and homeomorphism, two terms uh, which are quite, uh, I won't say confusing, but requires attention before we go into the mathematical part of topology.
so i think you have liked my video i am very thankful to all the subscribers who are recently subscribing to my channel you can put up questions to me through my email uh, which is there in the about section of my channel you can write me you can comment uh, i would like to make more videos on uh, topics which you would really like and from the core of my heart i'm really really thankful to all the subscribers who are subscribing and bearing with me for the next videos to come i would l lastly like to thank uh, one of my student uh, debolina who uh, took out the time to edit few of my videos and made certain animations uh, she has also uh, removed the sound part of my einstein's field equations and have given a better video so that the sound is not there and now you can listen to einstein's field equation space time curvature uh, in a much more decent way thank you very much please do take care stay safe and stay happy and i hope you like my video bye